Chapter Eight of Life in the Clearings versus the Bush by Susanna Moody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wearing Mourning for the Dead. What is death, my sister? Say, ask not, brother. Breathing clay. Ask the earth on which we tread, that silent empire of the dead. Ask the sea, its myriad waves, leaping leap o'er countless graves. Earth and ocean answer not, life is in their depths forgot. Ask yon pale extended form, unconscious of the coming storm, that breathed and spake an hour ago of heavenly bliss and penal woe. Within yon shrouded figure lies the mystery of mysteries. Among the many absurd customs that the sanction of time and the arbitrary laws of society have rendered indispensable, there is not one that is so much abused, and to which mankind so fondly clings, as that of wearing mourning for the dead. From the ostentatious public mourning appointed by governments for the loss of their rulers, down to the plain black badge worn by the humblest peasant for the death of parent or child. To attempt to raise one feeble voice against a practice sanctioned by all nations, and hallowed by the most solemn religious rites, appears almost sacrilegious. There is something so beautiful, so poetical, so sacred, in this outward sign of a deep and heartfelt sorrow, that to deprive death of his sable habiliments the melancholy hearse, funeral plumes, sombre pall, and a long array of drooping night-clad mourners, together with the awful clangor of the doleful bell, would rob the stern necessity of our nature of half its terrors, and tend greatly to destroy that religious dread which is so imposing, and which affords such a solemn lesson to the living. Alas, where is the need of all this black parade? It is not a reproach to him, who, in his wisdom, appointed death to pass upon all men. Were the sentence confined to the human species, we might have more reason for these extravagant demonstrations of grief. But in every object around us we see inscribed the mysterious law of change. The very mountains crumble and decay with years. The great sea shrinks and grows again. The lofty forest tree that has drank the dews of heaven laughed in the sunlight, and shook its branches at a thousand storms, yields to the same inscrutable destiny, and bows its tall forehead to the dust. Life lives upon death, and death reproduces life, through endless circles of being. From the proud tyrant man down to the blind worm, his iron heel tramples in the earth. Then wherefore should we hang out this black banner, for those who are beyond the laws of change and chance. Yea, they have finished, for them there is no longer any future. No evil hour knocks at their door, with tidings of mishap, far off are they, beyond desire or fear. It is the dismal adjuncts of death, which have invested it with those superstitious terrors that we would fain see removed. The gloom arising from these melancholy pageants forms a black cloud, whose dense shadow obscures the light of life to the living. And why, we ask, should death be invested with such horror? Death in itself is not dreadful. It is but the change of one mode of being for another, the breaking forth of the winged soul from its earthly chrysalis, or, as an old Latin poet has so happily described it, Thus life for ever runs its endless race, Death as a line which but divides the space, A stop which can but for a moment last, A point between the future and the past. Nature presents in all her laws such a beautiful and wonderful harmony, That it is as impossible for death to produce discord among them, As for night to destroy, by the intervention of its shadow, The splendour of the coming day. Were men taught from infancy to regard death as a natural consequence, a fixed law of their being, instead as an awful punishment for sin, 
as the friend and benefactor of mankind, not the remorseless tyrant and persecutor, to die would no longer be considered an evil. Let this hideous skeleton be banished into darkness, and replaced by a benignant angel, wiping away all tears, healing all pain, burying in oblivion all sorrow and care, calming every turbulent passion, and restoring man, reconciled to his Maker, to a state of purity and peace. Young and old should then go forth to meet him with lighted torches, and hail his approach with songs of thanksgiving and welcome. And this is really the case with all but the desperately wicked, who show that they despise the magnificent boon of life by the bad use they made of it, by their blasphemous defiance of God and good, and their unwillingness to be renewed in His image. The death angel is generally met with more calmness by the dying than by surviving friends. By the former, the dreaded enemy is hailed as a messenger of peace, and they sink tranquilly into his arms, with a smile upon their lips. The death of a Christian is a beautiful triumph over the fears of life. In him who conquered death, and led captivity captive, he finds the fruition of his being, the eternal blessedness promised to him in the gospel, which places him beyond the wants and woes of time. The death of such a man should be celebrated as a sacred festival, not lamented as a dreary execution, as the heir of a new birth, not the extinction of being. It is true that death is a profound sleep, from which no one can awaken to tell his dreams. But why on that account should we doubt that it is less blessed than its twin brother, whose resemblance it bears, and whose presence we all sedulously court? Invest sleep, however, with the same dismal garb. Let your bed be a coffin, your canopy a pall, your nightdress a shroud. Let the sobs of mourners and the tolling of bells lull you to repose, and few persons would willingly or tranquilly close their eyes to sleep. And then, this absurd fashion of wearing black for months and years for the dead. Let us calmly consider the philosophy of the thing, its use and abuse. Does it confer any benefit on the dead? Does it afford any consolation to the living? Morally or physically, does it produce the least good? Does it soften one regretful pang, or dry one bitter tear, or make the wearers wiser or better? If it does not produce any ultimate benefit, it should be at once discarded as a superstitious relic of more barbarous times, when men could not gaze on the simple, unveiled face of truth but obscure the clear daylight of her glance under a thousand fantastic masks. The ancients were more consistent in their mourning than the civilized people of the present day. They sat upon the ground and fasted, with rent garments and ashes strewn upon their heads. This mortification of the flesh was a sort of penance inflicted by the self-tortured mourner for his own sins than those of the dead. If this grief were not of a deep or lasting nature, the mourner found relief for his mental agonies in humiliation and personal suffering. He did not array himself in silk and wool and fine linen, and garments cut in the most approved fashion of the day, like our modern bow and bells, when they testify to the public of their grief for the loss of relation or friend, in the most expensive and becoming manner. Verily, if we must wear our sorrow upon our sleeve, why not return to the sackcloth and ashes as the most consistent demonstration of that grief which, hidden in the heart, surpasseth show? But then sackcloth is a most unmanageable material. A handsome figure would be lost, buried, annihilated, in a sackcloth gown. It would be so horribly rough. It would wound the delicate skin of a fine lady." It could not be confined in graceful folds by clasps of jet and pearl, and ornaments in black and gold. Sackcloth? Fah! Away with it! It smells of the knotted scourge and the carnal house. We too say, away with it! True grief has no need of such miserable provocatives to woe. The barbarians who cut and disfigured their faces for the dead showed a noble contempt of the world by destroying those personal attractions which the loss of the beloved had taught them to despise. 
but who now would have the fortitude and self-denial to imitate such an example? The mourners in crepe and silk and French merino would rather die themselves than sacrifice their beauty at the shrine of such a monstrous sorrow. How often have I heard a knot of gossips exclaim, as some widow of a gentleman in fallen circumstances glided by her in rusty weeds, What shabby black that woman wears for her husband! I should be ashamed to appear in public in such faded mourning. And yet the purchase of that shabby black may have cost the desolate mourner and her orphan children the price of many a necessary meal. Ah, this pudding of a poor family into black! and all the funeral trappings for pallbearers and mourners. What a terrific affair it is! What anxious thoughts, what bitter heartaches it costs! But the usages of society demand the sacrifice, and it must be made. The head of the family has suddenly been removed from his earthly toils, at a most complicated crisis of his affairs, which are so involved that scarcely enough can be collected to pay the expenses of the funeral and put his family into decent mourning. But every exertion must be made to do this. The money that might, after the funeral was over, have paid the rent of a small house, and secured the widow and her young family from actual want, until she could look around and obtain some situation in which she could earn a living for herself and them, must all be sunk in conforming to a useless custom, upheld by pride and vanity, in the name of grief." "'How will the funeral expenses ever be paid?' exclaims the anxious, weeping mother. "'When it's all over, and the morning bought, there will not remain a single copper to find us in bread.' The sorrow of obtaining this useless outward show of grief engrosses all the available means of the family, and that is expended upon the dead, which might, with careful management, have kept the living from starving. Oh, vanity of vanities! There is no folly on earth that exceeds the vanity of this. There are many persons who put off their grief when they put on their mourning, and it is a miserable satire on mankind to see these sombre-clad beings in festal halls mingling with the gay and happy, their melancholy garments affording a painful contrast to light laughter and eyes sparkling with pleasure. Their levity, however, must not be mistaken for hypocrisy. The world is in fault, not they. Their grief is already over, gone like a cloud from before the sun, but they are forced to wear black for a given time. They are true to the nature which teaches them that no grief with man is permanent, that the storms of to-day will not darken the heavens to-morrow. It is complying with a lying custom that makes them hypocrites, and, as the world always judges by appearance, it so happens that by adhering to one of its conventional rules, appearances, in this instance, are against them. Nay, the very persons who, in the first genuine outburst of natural grief, besought them to moderate their sorrow, to dry their tears, and be comforted for the loss they had sustained, are among the first to censure them for following advice so common and useless. Tears are as necessary to the afflicted as showers are to the parched earth, and are the best and sweetest remedy for excessive grief. The mourner, we would say, weep on. Nature requires your tears. They are sent in mercy by him who wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus. The man of sorrows himself taught us to weep. We once heard a very beautiful, volatile lady exclaim, with something very like glee in her look and tone, after reading a letter she had received by the post, with its ominous black bordering and seal. "'Grandmamma is dead. We shall have to go into deep mourning. I am so glad, for black is so becoming to me.' An old aunt who was present expressed her surprise at this indecorous avowal, when the young lady replied, with great naivety, "'I never saw Grandmamma in my life. I cannot be expected to feel any grief for her death.' "'Perhaps not,' said the aunt. "'But why, then, make a show of that which you do not feel?' "'Oh, it is the custom of the world. You know we must. It would be considered shocking not to go into very deep mourning for such a near relation.' The young lady inherited a very nice legacy, too, from her grandmamma, and had she spoken the truth, she would have said, "'I cannot weep for joy.' 
Her mourning, in consequence, was of the deepest and most expensive kind, and she really did look charming in her love of a black crape bonnet, as she skipped before the glass, admiring herself and it, when it came home fresh from the milliner's. In contrast to the pretty young heiress, we knew a sweet orphan girl, whose grief for the death of her mother, to whom she was devotedly attached, lay deeper than this hollow tinsel show. And yet the painful thought that she was too poor to pay this mark of respect to the memory of her beloved parent, in a manner suited to her birth and station, added greatly to the poignancy of her sorrow. A family, who had long been burdened with a cross old aunt, who was a martyr to rheumatic gout, and whose violent temper kept the whole house in awe, and whom they dared not offend for fear of her leaving her wealth to strangers, were in the habit of devoutly wishing the old lady a happy release from her sufferings. When this long-anticipated event at length took place, the very servants were put in the deepest mourning. What a solemn farce, we should say lie, was this! The daughters of a wealthy farmer had prepared everything to attend the great agricultural provincial show. Unfortunately, a grandfather to whom they all seemed greatly attached died most inconveniently the day before, and as they seldom kept a body in Canada over the second day, he was buried early in the morning of the one appointed for their journey. They attended the remains to the grave, but after the funeral was over they put off their black garments and started for the show, and did not resume them again until their return. People may think this very shocking, but it was not the laying aside the black that was so, but the fact of their being able to go from a grave to a scene of confusion and gaiety. The black clothes had nothing to do with this want of feeling, which would have remained the same under a black or scarlet vestment. A gentleman in this neighborhood, since dead, who attended a public ball the same week that he had seen a lovely child consigned to the earth, would have remained the same heartless parent dressed in the deepest sables. No instance that I have narrated of the business-like manner in which Canadians treat death is more ridiculously striking than the following. The wife of a rich mechanic had a brother lying, it was supposed, at the point of death. His sister sent a note to me, requesting me to relinquish an engagement I had made with a sewing-girl in her favour, as she wanted her immediately to make up her mourning the doctor having told her that her brother could not live many days. "'Mrs. Blank is going to be beforehand with death,' I said, as I gave the girl the desired release. I have known instances of persons being too late with their mourning to attend a funeral, but this is the first time I have ever heard it being made in anticipation. After a week the girl returned to her former employment. "'Well, Anne, is Mr. Blank dead?' No, ma'am, nor likely to die this time, and his sister is so vexed that she bought such expensive mourning, and all for no purpose. The brother of this provident lady is alive to this day, the husband of a very pretty wife, and the father of a family, while she, poor body, has been consigned to the grave for more than three years. During her own dying illness, a little girl greatly disturbed her sick mother with the noise she made. Her husband, as an inducement to keep the child quiet, said, "'Mary, if you do not quit that, I'll whip you. But if you keep still like a good girl, you shall go to Ma's funeral.' An artist cousin of mine was invited, with many other members of the Royal Academy, to attend the funeral of the celebrated Nolikens the sculptor. The party filled twelve mourning coaches, and were furnished with silk gloves, scarfs, and hat-bands, and a dinner was provided after the funeral was over at one of the large hotels. "'A merrier set than we were on that day,' said my cousin. "'I never saw. We all got jovial, and it was midnight before any of us reached our respective homes. The whole affair vividly brought to my mind that description of the gondola given so graphically by Byron, that it contained much fun, like the morning coaches when the funeral's done.' Some years ago I witnessed the funeral of a young lady, the only child of very wealthy parents, who resided in Bedford Square. The heiress of their enviable riches was a very delicate, fragile-looking girl, and on the day that she attained her majority, her parents gave a large dinner-party, followed by a ball in the evening, to celebrate the event. 
It was during the winter. The night was very cold. The crowded rooms overheated. The young lady thinly but magnificently clad. She took a chill in leaving the close ballroom for the large, ill-warmed supper room. And three days after, the hope of these rich people lay insensible on her beer. I heard from every one that called upon Mrs. L., the relative and friend with whom I was staying, of the magnificent funeral would be given to Miss C. Ah, little heeded that pale, crushed flower of yesterday, the pomp that was to convey her from the hot bed of luxury to the cold, damp vault of St. Giles' melancholy-looking church. I stood at Mrs. L.'s window, which commanded a view of the whole square, to watch the procession pass up Russell Street to the place of internment. The morning was intensely cold, and large snowflakes fell lazily and heavily to the earth. The poor, dingy sparrows, with their feathers ruffled up, hopped mournfully along the pavement in search of food. They, in spite of all their feathers, were a cold. The mutes that attended the long line of mourning coaches stood motionless, leaning on their long staves wreathed with white, like so many figures that the Frost King had stiffened into stone. The hearse, with its snowy plumes, drawn by six milk-white horses, might have served for the regal car of his northern majesty, so ghost-like and chilly were they in its sepulchral trappings. At length the coffin, covered with black velvet, and a pall lined with white silk and fringed with silver, was borne from the house, and deposited in the gloomy depth of the stately hearse. The hired mourners, in their sable dresses and long white hat-bands and scarves, rode slowly forward, mounted on white horses, to attend this bride of death to her last resting-place. The first three carriages that followed contained the family physician and surgeon, a clergyman, and the male servants of the house, in deep sables. The family carriage, too, was there, but empty, and of a procession in which a hundred and forty-five private carriages made a conspicuous show, all but those enumerated above were empty. Strangers drove strange horses to that vast funeral, and hired servants were the only members of the family that conducted the last scion of that family to the grave. Truly it was the most dismal spectacle we ever witnessed, and we turned from it sick at heart, and with eyes moist with tear, not shed for the dead, for she had escaped from this vexatious vanity, but from the heartless mockery of all this fictitious woe. The expense of such a funeral probably involved many hundred pounds, which had been better bestowed on charitable purposes. Another evil arriving out of this absurd custom is the high price attached to black clothing, on account of the necessity that compels people to wear it for so long a period after the death of a near relation, making it a matter of still greater difficulty for the poorer class to comply with the usages of society. But who cares about the poor whether they go into mourning for their friends or no? It is a matter of no consequence." Ah, there it is, and this is not the least forcible argument we have to advance against this useless custom. If it becomes a moral duty for the rich to put on black for the death of a friend, it must be morally necessary for the poor to do the same. We see no difference in the degrees of moral feeling. The soul of man is of no rank, but of equal value in our eyes, whether belonging to rich or poor. But this usage is so general, and the neglect of it considered such a disgrace, that it leaves a very wide door open for the entrance of false pride. Poverty is an evil which most persons, however humble their stations may be, most carefully endeavour to conceal. To avoid an exposure of their real circumstances, they will deprive themselves of the common necessaries of life, and incur debts which they have no prospect of paying rather than allowing their neighbours to suspect that they cannot afford a handsome funeral, and good mournings for any deceased member of their family. If such persons would but follow the dictates of true wisdom, honesty, and truth, no dread of the opinion of others should tempt them to do what they cannot afford. 
their grief for the dead would not be less sincere if they followed the body of the beloved in their ordinary costume to the grave nor is the spectacle less imposing divested of all the solemn foppery which attends the funeral of persons who move in respectable society some years ago when it was the fashion in england and maybe it remains the fashion still to give black silk scarves and hat-bands at funerals mean and covetous persons threw themselves in the way of picking up these stray loaves and fishes a lady who lived in the town with me after i was married boasted to me that her husband who always contrived to be a necessary attendant on such occasions found her in all the black silk she required for articles of dress and that he had not purchased a pair of gloves for many years about two years before old king george the third died a report got about that he could not survive many days there was a general rush among all ranks to obtain mourning up went the price of black goods norwich crepes and bombazines rose ten per cent and those who were able to secure a black garment at any price to show their loyalty were deemed very fortunate and after all this fuss and hurry and confusion the poor mad old king disappointed the spectators in sables and lived on in darkness and mental aberration for two whole years the mourning of some on that occasion was real not imaginary the sorrow with them was not for the king's death but that he had not died on these public occasions of grief great is the stir and bustle in economical families who wish to show a decent concern for the death of the monarch but who do not exactly like to go to the expense of buying new clothes for such a short period as a court mourning all the old family stores are rummaged carefully over and every stuff gown worn ribbon or shabby shawl that can take a black dye is handed over to the vat and these second-hand black garments have a more mournful appearance than the glossy suits of the gay and wealthy for it is actually humiliating to wear such as they are both unbecoming to the young and old black which is the most becoming and convenient color for general wear especially to the old and middle-aged would no longer be regarded with religious horror as the type of mortality and decay but would take its place on the same shelf with the gay tints that form the motley groups in our handsome stores could influential people be found to expose the folly and vanity of this practice and refuse to comply with its demands others would soon be glad to follow their example and before many years it would sink into contempt and disuse if the americans the most practical people in the world would but once take up the subject and publicly lecture on its absurdity this dismal shadow of a darker age would no longer obscure our streets and scare our little ones men would wear their grief in their hearts and not around their hats and widows would be better known by their serious deportment than by their weeds i feel certain that every thinking person who calmly investigates the subject will be tempted to exclaim with me oh that the good sense of mankind would unite in banishing it for ever from the earth the song of faith house of clay frail house of clay in the dust thou soon must lie spirit spread thy wings away strong in immortality to worlds more bright o oh, wing thy flight to win the crown and robe of light hopes of dust false hopes of dust smiling as the morning fair why do we confiding trust in trifles light as air like flowers that wave above the grave ye cheer without the power to save joys of earth vain joys of earth sandy your foundations be mortals overrate your worth sought through life so eagerly too soon we know that tears must flow that bliss is still allied to woe human love fond human love we have worshipped at thy shrine envying not the saints above while we deemed thy power divine but ah thy light so wildly bright is born of earth to set in night 
Love of heaven, love of heaven, let us pray for thine increase. Happiness by thee is given, hopes and joys that never cease. With thee will soar death's dark tide o'er, where earth can stain the soul no more. End of chapter 8